Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Our next guests are the directors and stars of the new film, Cubby. In it, co-director and writer Mark Blaine plays Mark, a nervous, edgy young man who moves to New York City and discovers what it takes to be an adult. Let's take a look at Cubby. Bye. Your grandson got a job in New York City. So you got a job at an art gallery? They made me an offer I could not refuse. Sometimes you have to bend the truth to get by. This time I went too far. Will you go to school with me? Milo really likes you. You're a big part of his world now. You can teach me how to read, and I'll teach you how to draw. Milo, he gets me. I know he's six, but he's like my best friend. Ew, Mark! Oh, Mark, you're gross. People trust you with their kids. I, I don't always take my pills. It's a controlled substance. I control how much I take. Boy. Man. I called him Leather Man. Unashamed and unafraid, he was like a superhero. About today, I I'm never late. I'm so not a late person. But if you're going to be late, you really need to call us. Have I seen you around? Probably not. Think of a time in your memory where you felt safe. I'll always be here for you, okay? I love you. Earth stinks! Let's move to Pluto! I feel disgusting. Why?! Mark, you are somewhat unbearable. But who wants to be bearable, right? You should know better. He doesn't know what he wants. He's six years old. He does know what he wants. I'm raising your son. You're not raising my son. Please welcome co-director, writer, and star Mark Blaine, Patricia Richardson, and co-director Ben Mankoff. Guys, thank you so much for being here. Give them another round of applause, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, congrats on this beautiful film. Uh, it is uh, a small story about people, people living in New York that is somehow a story that I've never seen told. I feel like every time I see a small story about people living in New York, especially like white artists, I'm like, okay, yeah, I got this. That's so awesome to hear. It's that been covered, so cool but there are... There nuances and pieces of this character I have never seen uh, this this particular kind of character told. Um, well, let's get to that in a minute. I want to talk about the technical stuff of the movie as a, as a nerd. It's shot on 16 millimeter, which is a very hard thing to do. Um, it's a very rare thing that people do these days. What made you make that decision and what sort of fights did you have to have with the people paying for the movie? <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is a good one. Yeah, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm Mark, the character is a really... Uh, kind of backwards looking character. He's very nostalgic for his own childhood and for um, uh, the leather man, that kind of uh, historical uh, sexual fantasy that he has. And I felt like it immediately throws you into that nostalgic state of mind, the 16 millimeter. You're in another world entirely. I have um, a thing also for like um, 90s adventure movies, like Adventures in Babysitting. And I'd been looking at a lot of films I watched growing up, like Harriet the Spy with Rosie O'Donnell. Like, no one knows or cares about that movie, but I do. That's so strange because that is, like, not the vibe that I get from this. <laughs> I get, like, Nicole Hall of Center walking and talking and, like, nice. Andrew Bajalski of the early to mid-2000s. Yeah. I do not get well, ch child adventure movies. <laughs> well, but Ben and I have a really nice dynamic as co-directors. I mean, um, he was inspired by The Graduate, and we also looked at... Um, uh, Sheila Levine is dead and living in New York City with Jeannie Berlin, and I'm wearing this shirt with, you know, Muriel from Muriel, Muriel's Wedding, and Ruth Stoops from Citizen Ruth. Like, we were looking at movies with, like, really difficult characters who are kind of awful, but you still care about them and love them. And um, 16 millimeter was the only way to go. Like, the movie was just not digital. When we were shooting, we never saw any dailies. Yeah, no, the whole time. We saw weeklies, maybe. 
um, at best, and they were not synced with sound. <laughs> was that hard for you? It was incredibly difficult. Is this we didn't the first thing that you've shot on sixteen, so you had to sort of acclimate yourself. Yeah. To that? So it was Mark and I are both first time filmmakers. Neither of us had ever made a short film even before. People said you need to make a short, and we're like, no. Had you right. worked together before on stuff, no. or was this the first time? Okay, wow. Yeah. Um, and just to finish the 16 millimeter, um, we, it was hard to convince people that it was a good idea, um, not aesthetically, but practically. Of course. But fortunately, we had um, more equipment, it's more time. Yeah, exactly. More and mistakes, less takes, though. Less yeah. takes and less time to, to screw around. Less around people were, more concentration on set. People were very serious. Yeah. And I never watched myself, and I think that was a blessing. Yeah. This is my first time ever acting on film. We didn't have a monitor that was really <laughs> usable at all. Um, but our cinematographer, uh, he, he was a 16 millimeter pro. That was his, that's his medium. And that made it entirely possible. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to do it. I also want to say that like, my dad, my family owns a camera store in Indiana. Oh. Um, and my dad is actually here. And he has, like, this store is, like, 85 years old. My dad's not 85. But the store is very old. And I, like, stocked the camera shelves when I was a kid. And so I have this, this memory of film and fixing cameras. And I'd, when I was making a movie, I was like, yep, the can of film. Like, that's what you make a movie with. Like, I couldn't imagine doing digital. So You will be at some point. <laughs> we, well, the next one, we need a bigger budget, and then we'll do film. But, yeah, I, we can't do film again. <laughs> Patricia, what made you want to be uh, a part of this? This is the great Patricia Richardson, who was everybody's mom when we were little kids in a lot of ways. I, I, I hope you don't mind me saying that. Some people would. Um, well, I would do any film offered to me if it wasn't Christian or porn. <laughs> Are those the only opportunities no, don't that quote me on that. Uh, uh, no, I had just finished doing um, a play at Bucks County, and, and Henry Bergstrom, who cast me in that, uh, called me and said, would you do this independent film? And I love Henry, and he said, this guy's really talented, and they're adding this character, which is what they did. They, they did an extra week of, of filming uh, so that they could add this mother. We, we made the film without the character, and then a yeah. year later shot a new week of scenes with her and then just like inserted it, like we surgically changed the movie. And it was very cool because David France was there too and I just went and met them and we spent a whole day kind of writing it, really kind of. Patricia is an amazing writer. So um, kind of I don't want to you know, start rumors, but I mean, <laughs> can you, um, do you actually believe that Home Improvement for as many years as it was on, that a bunch of guys in a room were writing the voice of America's mom? No, and there was no woman on Home Improvement that had any power or writing power. So I was the only woman. Why does that room. surprise me? Well, she she doesn't have any writing credits. Is the problem? No. no, you know what I did is instead of going for uh, the producing writing credits that I could have done, I went for the money. So I I own some of Home Improvement. Really? Mm -hmm. So that's what I did because I was uh, you know the cancer episode was mine. It came from my son having a big thyroid cancer scare. They never give me any credit for it. But the, I, give I, Patricia credit. I, I gave them that idea. So Patricia I, I like wrote a lot of what's in There's a Cubby. lot of stuff like that. I would write, you know, have whole ideas for episodes and say, why don't you do an episode about this? And so, yeah. When you walked into the writer's room for Home Improvement, I, you guys did this. I'm sorry. We're going to get no, back to the in, movie. Tim and I were the only ones who, after the first read through, would go into the room and talk with the writers about that script. And sometimes it was like, everybody go home and rewrite the entire thing. Was it all men? In the, All in, men. In the writers there was no woman in the room to say, this is not what women would do. This is not what women would say. And at first I was so intimidated because I'd been an actress all my life and the lowest person on the, the totem pole. I couldn't imagine telling writers or producers, you know, my opinion about anything. I was just like, yeah, that's how you so get, lucky that, to have a job. You're taught so, that's how you get fired. Yeah, yeah, so at first I was just sort of like, why are they writing this way? You know, and, and so at first it was hard. And... And it was just trying to get through and, 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 and defend Tim, because they were horrible to Tim. Tim was great. Really? I mean, from the beginning. I don't want to talk about this too much. But he, he was. He was just great. So, uh, yeah, so it was mo more like just kind of that. But then eventually I, I, I would start to try to say things like, I, I don't think a woman would say that. And then, what do you mean? And, and then I actually got lines like this from them. They'd say, um, well, it's not like we don't understand women. We're married to them. And, and this they would say to me when I'd say, no, no, really, I've called all my sisters across the country, and we all agree no woman would do that or say that or feel that. 
people think well, that we don't times agree. have changed, right? Uh, yeah, you know, I, mean, I was like, what? And so, you know, so that's what that yeah. was. Uh, one, more, one more question about it. And I, I have one, uh, sorry, we, we'll, we'll, we're going to talk a lot about Cubby, but now that we're here. Uh, since <laughs> oh, I grew up with sorry. Home Improvement and I watched... Uh, no, don't, don't be sorry. You're going to get a great clip out of this and it's going to promote the movie as well. Uh, okay, okay. Um, when, when I watched Home Improvement as a child, I don't think I got it. But then when it was in syndication, it was in reruns and I would see it as an adult. One of the things that always baffled me about Home Improvement, and this goes back to a writer's room, I think controlled by men, is that Jill's main source of power over Tim all the time was denying him sex in a family show. Wait, I don't I remember that. that. Like, really? I thought that was baffling. I, I don't remember doing that. No, the, I, I didn't feel like that's what she was really? holding over. No, I, I don't. I kind of remember that now. No, yeah, I, I always, really? like, as an adult, I would be like, I think, oh, that's so weird. It's like a family Isn't show. Isn't that what all women do? It would be implied. <laughs> is it? I didn't, I don't. Well, I'll tell you why. Because of the basic difference between men and women, which is what the whole okay. show is supposed to be about. Which is, a male writer's is that women, if, that. if men and, okay, if men and women are having a fight and they're having disagreement and there's been a problem, right? Women cannot deal with getting close or trusting a guy until they feel understood. Until they, until they feel that whatever happened, the man, it's not even a question of saying, yeah, I'm sorry. That, that doesn't work. We, we have to feel that they understand what what happened or what we, you know, what happened. And until we feel that, it's not just a question of being sorry or whatever, we have to feel understood. Now, men can just have sex no matter what. You know, and in fact, they hey, feel, hey, hey. wait a minute, they feel that if they have sex, that'll fix it. Because that's how they feel close again. You know, because if they have sex and they feel like that we can get close again if we have sex, then it'll all be fixed. You know, so they feel like they can fix the problem by having sex. Women are like, don't you dare come near me, I'll kill you, you know? <laughs> Because you are not, you are not safe. You are not, not safe for me. I'm not safe it. with you right. because you hurt me and, and you're not coming near me until I'm not hurt anymore and I'm not going to stop being hurt until I feel like you understand what you did to hurt me. So, uh, so it's not about withholding. It's not about just like punishing you. It is about, I'm not safe with you. Do you think that came across in the show? As, as well, well, you know, so I don't know. I wasn't, I don't, I guess what I'm saying is I never felt yeah. like Jill was withholding to punish him in any way. Well, no, no, see, you I know, never, I, I just yeah. feel, you know, and that, that's like a basic misunderstanding. And the, when they first uh, tried to get me to do the show, I was replacing somebody and I didn't want to do it because I didn't want, I'd done three, three shows before this and I never wanted to be a thankless mom. So I said, no, 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 you know, and I had just given birth to twins. And I was nursing twins, and I didn't want to. And they said, no, no, it's not going to be a thankless mom part. And, you know, blah, it's going to be just as much about Jill as it is about Tim. And it's about you just don't understand the Deborah Tannen book. And uh, so they gave me all this crap that turned out not to be true. <laughs> they, that's, what they, that's what they always do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, they, they told me all that. And they, and they really did mean the show to be about why men and women sh uh, should never be together. <laughs> Uh, really, uh, about why they can't get along, and because they have these different agendas, and they have so you know, so they wanted it to be really about that, and so they wanted the show to be about this kind of collision of feminism and masculinism, and and the way we got along anyway. Can I segue so yeah. to something? Oh, you want to jump? I mean, we'll get to Cubby, but we can keep going with. No, no, I don't want to talk about Cubby. I want to segue into something. I mean, I'm about this. Because I want to talk about Cubby. What Patricia's saying is truth, and like telling the truth and telling your own truth in 2019 is the thing, and it can be really cliche. Uh, there's authenticity and all these words being thrown around, but what do they mean? But speaking out is is really important, and saying what's real and what's real with this movie and us is that this is an anomaly that we made this movie. Yeah. You asked just like, oh, you never worked together. And it's like, no, we didn't because we are not rich kids that went to NYU and are built into a system. Syracuse. <laughs> went to Syracuse for acting. But you know, we weren't built into the system where you automatically have internships and we're not related to anyone. And everyone that I know that makes indie films, they are wealthy people yeah, so, and hey. have family money. And this, my parents, we're lower middle class. They put everything they made into, you know, making us happy kids and um, giving us, you know, what they could. But One of the most frustrating things about being around indie filmmakers is you're like, what have you been doing all week? And they're like, working on a script. And you're like, no, but what have you been doing yeah, for work? For exactly. like, like, I had to work all week to exactly. get by. And a year ago, I was sitting in this audience getting paid, you know, what I, you get paid to sit in this audience. <laughs> Sorry. Wait, you get paid? Yeah, sorry. But anyways, Fine, I, was, editors. I oh was doing it. I was doing it so I could eat that day. 
I mean, and I was watching, I think, Leah Thompson talk about her daughter's movie, and they talked about all these struggles. <laughs> just and I was with like, jealousy. well, I was hearing about the struggle, and it's like, Super rich. Leah and her husband. well, I mean, of course, I mean, it's amazing if you can make a movie and have all this history behind you. But what Ben and I did was an anomaly um, funding an LGBTQ movie. It's a slacker comedy. Yeah. It's a slacker comedy, and there are no slacker comedies with gay men. And if they are, they're like supermodels or like Ryan Gosling pretending to be gay. I also you know? think there aren't any LGBTQ comedies about anxiety and mental health as well, or at least that not not that I know of that that I've really seen, which was the angle that I found to be quite That's original. exactly what made well, me want to make the film. Well, Mark. there may be. I mean, there are characters like him. Yeah. Uh, you know, what, what are all these characters you're always mentioning that are... They're all women. Yeah, yeah but there have been male odd Stoops characters, but they aren't gay. Yeah. These women, time. though, the reviews of Ruth Stoops and Muriel, of Tony Collette and Laura Dern, people call them disgusting. They call Tony Collette fat in the reviews that came out in 94 or 96. And... Um, and it's interesting, I think our movie's divisive. People love the character or they're like annoyed. And I think that's characters in 2019 don't need to be perfect. People can make mistakes. Like we make mistakes in real life. We can watch characters do bad things. And like, you know, I'm saying bad things. Like there's no one, no one gets murdered in this movie, okay? Like there's nothing, you know, awful happening. Don't say that, you want to sell the film. Okay, yeah, there's so <laughs> much murder. But the other so thing is, so is that um, in, in a lot of, of films, unfortunately. All of those people perish. Yeah, all these people die. So yeah. <laughs> they all die. Uh, you were saying that's the reason that no. you wanted to be a part of the movie. Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, so Mark and I are, we have a lot of uh, similarities. We love the same kinds of movies. We grew up in the similar economic uh, place in, uh, in the strata, and um, but we have a lot of differences, um, namely our sexuality. And the place that we were able to really come together was around learning how to be a person in the world at all, no matter your sexuality, your background, and how difficult that is in New York City, especially. Um, and and really, these, these three levels of masculinity that are presented in the film, Marx, the little boy, and then the fantasy of the leather man. And also the, the husband of the, of the, yeah. of the child the that he's babysitting. Yeah. 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 He's, a former, he's, he, he's in there as well, I think. That's right. And, you know... He shows up saying lines from the Terminator. Right, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> exactly. About masculinity. Right. Um, and I, you know, I grew up in Texas um, and wasn't into football. Um, Denton? You know Denton, yeah. um, <laughs> and so and in and that world, especially then, there was a very narrow conception of what masculinity could be, if you were a straight guy, and um, and in this movie, the script really um, it resonated with my desire to be um, defining my own masculinity, and I think that Mark, as he's going through the movie, is defining his own masculinity. And it's not as it's not a coming out story. It's not about sexual tra trauma or anything like that. Um, it took seven years to make anxiety. this movie, yeah. and I. But it is about uh, you growing up and you yes you changing. And so many movies, the characters really don't go anywhere. You don't well, they see do, they transform. You don't see, and, and then you're so transforming unreal. in the movie, and the movie is about your growth. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about you learning to self parent. Yeah. Kind of. I want to say that Ben, like, we had so many, I had so many people looking at the script for several years while I was writing it, mainly gay men, because, you know, everyone's like, oh, you have to have a gay director, you have to have a gay, you know, this, 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 it's a gay movie. And everybody wanted to sexualize the movie even more, and they wanted to cut the kid out, and they wanted to make it something that it wasn't. And I was like, why can't I make a romantic comedy fairy tale, you know, slacker movie about a, just a guy? And Ben read the script and saw the heart and sexuality didn't matter. And I think that's the definition of, of an ally or you know, what's, whatever's better than an ally. So but thank you, Ben. I mean, sexuality, his sexuality didn't matter. But sexuality matters in the movie. I think that's what's so interesting. It's yeah, not definitely. just a depiction of a, uh, like he is actually in some ways coming, he's out, but he's still kind of coming to terms, not just what, with his sexuality, but what he actually desires. But would you say that it doesn't define the movie? That's no, it not does the not define him or the movie uh, uh, or at him. all. I mean, they never, we never say the word gay in the movie. And people sort of just accept it. I mean, it's sort of like Schitt's Creek, where no one really talks about sexuality. That's one of the reasons the show is really 
beloved. No one really does it in real life any for the most part anymore. No one in real life is like, you're gay? Tell me about it. You know, like, <laughs> no. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, I as a straight do. man, maybe, do people go, oh, are you straight? Uh, oh, my God, all the time. People are just like, <laughs> well, no, because, like, you people know. Go, go, people go, whoa, 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 are you straight? Get out of here, buddy. No, <laughs> but, you know, it's it's still not perfect. Like, I'm on the subway late at night, and, like, I still have to, like, put a guard on. Like, I can't, you know, I know, I've yeah. seen people on the subway on their way home from bars, like, wiping, you know, glitter off their face because people will screw with you. So I, I don't know. I think sexuality still is, there are still people out there that are uncomfortable. Yeah, I guess, I mean, within the context of the situations that most of this movie takes place, mm -hmm. it's not necessary. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be an issue. It wouldn't be an issue. Yeah. Except around uh, Milo, the little boy's parents, right. who I think see themselves as progressive Park Slope liberal people. They hire an out gay man to babysit their son. And yet their really deep, um, not malicious biases do st start to show through as the movie goes on. Um, they, they have some discomfort. So. He was just, he was a bad babysitter. That's so funny. He was a At bad our last babysitter. interview, I, right, so. At Sirius XM, our interview, the guy that interviewed us watched it three times last night and said he's an incredible babysitter. I'm not saying he's right or you're wrong. I'm just saying it's incredible how people can think he's both these things because he has a, a very, tender relationship with the kid. I think he has a tender relationship with the kid, yes, but like that's not enough when someone is your babysitter. Like mm, the practical absolutely. aspect of being on time and being reliable is more important I think uh, than having just like a tender relationship with a kid. Absolutely, and that's not to minimize that. That's he a, makes yeah. bad choices, which is why yeah. we. Didn't and so, what I was saying that. in this last interview is that as a mother of, you know, of children, and also, you know, I have a gay son, I I felt tremendous sympathy and care. For, also, I play a mother, but um, throughout the film and worry about him, but totally identified with the mother. Oh, of yeah. course, I totally understood every decision made by those parents and agreed with them. You know, I was like, yeah, yeah, I would do that. So uh, I, I felt that, you know, I felt that the mother was sympathetic and also very well played by Janine. Yeah, um, Janine Sorales, who plays she's, Annie, she's is great. incredible. Um, she was in Inside Lewin Davis, played Lewin Davis' sister, Joy. Oh, yeah. She's like two scenes. That's where we she, saw her and we really like... Good. Her in our movie. She's but, you know, so I didn't think she was unsympathetic. Did you? Are you saying that? Not you at all. She's uh, really good. No, no, yeah. no. I didn't. I said that I agreed with with, with, agreed with them right. by and large. Yeah. yeah. But I but I never was sympathetic. A lot of what inspired that writing is I did babysit and I would go to the park and when I would talk to other babysitters who are mostly girls there is this weird thing like girls are treated differently as babysitters like um parents flirted a lot like the dads would flirt i mean park slope sorry to call you out but um yeah you know these parents a lot of them are really rich and it's this weird dynamic and the parents that i worked for first of all i am not that babysitter in the movie i do not do the bad things he does but um parents didn't know what to do with me you know like the kids wanted me to put them to bed at times, and that was scary for a mom and dad who's not around all the time. But it's because, like, I would go to the park, I'd be, like, you know, rolling through the dirt with them, and all these other nannies are, like, on their phones. Like, they don't care about the kids. And I think that my connection, and it was because, like, as a, as a gay person in my, well, now I'm 30, but in my late 20s when I was, or early 20s when I was babysitting, I felt like I lost a part of my childhood by coming out so young, people started telling me, you know, you're gonna get AIDS, like, you should kill yourself, like, horrible things in Indiana, which is, you know, not surprising. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I lost my childhood a little bit. I learned how to be, like, silent. And then when you're in your 20s and you're an artist and you're like, oh, babysitting, I'll do this, all of a sudden my mind, like, opened up. I got to be a kid again. And that's what inspired the character. And I, I took it to, an, obviously, an, a whole nother level because, um, you know, it's a movie, you gotta make it fun and wacky and bring in a leather daddy, come on. Uh, I think time for a couple questions from the audience. Who's a question? No question. Hi, um, I was just wondering, uh, shooting in the city is obviously a really hard thing. You have to be really resourceful. What were some of your biggest challenges doing that? Um, Patricia and I were, were driving in Soho. We All we had to do was park the car at the beginning of the movie. And our challenges are honestly, New Yorkers. They hate film crews. And I think it's because of big budget movies 
and Netflix and all these people that are taking up whole streets. You have a tiny little movie like us. We're taking up so much, like, so little space, and people are angry. They'll walk right through the shot. I mean, that's the whole thing. You don't, if you're a small movie, you really can't shoot outdoors. You have to find interiors and have that control. And interiors. And paid to be quiet. Right. That's interiors in New York City are just smaller than anywhere else. And expensive. And expensive. But you, we shot in Mark's real apartment in his real bedroom. And we there was no room to, to put the camera anywhere but right in the middle and point in different directions. My room is actually nice. We took everything out of it. I don't actually sleep on a couch. I don't have Beanie Babies everywhere. I don't have a lava lamp. Right. I don't have garbage and pizza boxes next to my bed. That is the character. That is not my real yes. life. Yes. But the, the point is that even, even interiors are hard because spaces here are just smaller across the board. Uh, one more. Hi. Hi. Um, you guys talked a lot about like connecting with your characters. So I was wondering if you guys had any like self discoveries while making the film, like with your characters. Mark. Well, I want to say with my with working with Patricia for a week, and when I rewrote the script and shot again, um, and wrote this mother character, I thought a lot about the relationship with my mom, who's here in the back row, and uh, you know, my mom was. Both my parents were great, and I think mother characters in movies are great. So sorry, Dad, I didn't include you. But um, working with Patricia, a lot of these things came up of what it's like to come out and and show your mom who you are, and also ha let her tell you it's going to be okay. And I think my mom got to do that at points, but also it's really hard when I mean she's not my mom's not gay. She doesn't know what it's like to come out. So um, I discovered a lot about my re relationship and my love for my mom. Um, through working with Patricia, and and I thank Patricia for bringing her motherhood to the character, and and helping make that as authentic as possible. I, I think for me, I, I, um, it made me more relieved that I have this relationship with my son that I have, because because of where I the social milieu that that my son grew up in in Los Angeles and. You know, he didn't come out really to most of the world until, you know, he was in college back east here. Um, he didn't feel that he could come out in Los Angeles, but he, he came out to me. So, um, I, I, you know, I, we were able to talk about it from his junior year in high school on, you know, and have always been able to talk about it. And he was able to talk about it within the family. Um, so there wasn't, you know, in the whole film, you and I never talk about it. Never, never. But it's, never do. But it's because but we're I, it's caring like for I each know, other. It's like I obviously know that, you know, you know, it's like I know you don't belong in Indiana. I know you're going to be better off here. Whether I know that that's a part of it, obviously I do. But, um, but the fact that she can't talk about it. So um, th that was interesting to me, and I, uh, I felt sort of lucky about that. But also I, I started questioning. I've always questioned. Um, some of the things that I wish I had done with Joe differently, you know. It's powerful. I think my mom has the same thing. I think a lot of mothers of gay sons, they, it's because you don't I, have a learning curve. I mean, there is a learning curve, but no one's telling you what to do. And I learned something from Glee. I know that sounds odd, but uh, oh, wow, yeah. I saw, I, I saw, uh, you know, a, a piece on Glee when the father was talking to the son about sex. And I had not talked to Joe about sex. I didn't know how to talk to Joe about sex. And, and then I saw an episode about where he was talking to his son about sex and saying, you know, we're men. We're, you know, and you're going to be having sex with men, and you're both men, and men tend to think about sex a little more casually. And that could lead you to not being, not being careful with yourself, not protecting yourself, not, you know, and being too... Um, I can't remember how he put it, but being um, uh, careless uh, about protecting yourself and, and being preserving yourself, being more careful, and it, that's going to be a trap, and, and look out for that. And, uh, because you're both men, which is <laughs> going to be a little dicey there. That's going to be you know, dangerous, and, and you, should, you should respect yourself. And, and you know, So th there was this talk about that, and, and I'm listening to that going, oh, that didn't even occur to me to talk to Joe in that way. Um, so yeah, there's lessons all along and 
Anyway, I'm sorry. That's oh, that's okay. Uh, anytime someone wants to talk about Mike O'Malley on Glee, I'm for it. Uh, <laughs> guys, uh, how can people see Cubby? When can people see it? Well, uh, we'll be in theaters starting next weekend uh, in L.A. and New York in the Lemley. Is that you? Lemley it? Glendale. Lemley Glendale in uh, L.A. and at Cinema Village just around the corner here. Um, and we're having our New York City premiere tonight, tonight. at New Fest. And we're the we're the New York centerpiece film, which is really we're great. Uh, the great carpet, for that. the whole shebang. I'm about where it's on, it'll be video on demand. It'll be iTunes, Amazon. Yeah. Everywhere that you can rent a movie. November 12th, I think. Actually, it's either Amazon or Hulu or Netflix. Uh, which one? We got it all. I made sure we got it all. <laughs> we also we also have a DVD, and I'm really Ooh. proud about it. It's very nostalgic. It's the way it's designed. I kind of copied Muriel's Director's wedding. commentary. DVDs yeah. are all nostalgic. All the special speeches. No. Yeah. Right. I know. Well, we had VHS tapes. Like, we, our generation did. Right. Right. Um, everybody, go see Cubby uh, see in theaters. It's, uh, it looks beautiful. And give these guys a huge round of applause for coming in. Thank you.